What I wanted to really focus in on today is our results from round two and specifically talk a bit about chlorination. I've been really pleased to see in the yellow book, um, and I was rereading Danielle's review of chlorination in emergencies and just talking to a lot of the implementers about how much more focus there is on looking at the residual, making adjustments, because we know chlorine is definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so let's just get on with it. <coughs> not going to go into detail here, but in 2014, WHO established an international scheme to evaluate water treatment performance. It was based on many of our other schemes around hoopas, you may know on bed nets, pharmaceuticals, because we basically recognize that there's huge variation in the types of products as well as the performance. And at the national level, there's very little capacity to do rigorous testing. Okay, so. The objective is basically to inform government, to perform, inform procurers on what works and also what doesn't work because we realize that's just as important. Um, there was a little quiz here. I'm not going to go through it, but if quickly you want to check your scientific knowledge on log removal, Monica's like, yeah, do the quiz, do the quiz. Okay, okay. <laughs> If we have a filter demonstrating 99.999% of protozoa reduction, 99.9% .9 of bacteria, and 90% of virus, which performance classification would it receive? Whoever gets the answer right gets a free chocolate. <laughs> I know Kate likes chocolate. Just steal from okay, anybody, any hands? <laughs> Danielle, you're not allowed. <laughs> okay, you're feeling stumped. Nobody wants to think right now. Okay, so for the protozoa, we see, okay, it does quite well, which is great. Um, for the bacteria, not bad, above, above two log. But unfortunately, for the viruses, it does not do very well. And as we know, viruses, the infectious dose is very low. So that is why that the standard for viruses is higher than some of those other pathogens. So it would meet our um, targeted protection category. So not bad, it's still obviously um, removing a number of, of um, the, the organisms, but obviously if virus is your concern, and we know from the GEM study that um, viruses are one of the number one etiological agents of diarrhea, you may not want to choose this filter. Okay, round one result, hopefully you've seen the report. If not, it's online. Um, we tested 10 products. As you can see, we had a variety of um, performance. The ones that did the best were the Life Straw, so they um, all were in our comprehensive category. We had another of, a, a number of other products that met our two-star, which means that it um, removed sufficiently to protect health all three classes of pathogens, protozoa, bacteria, and viruses. We had two products that failed completely. Um, Silverdyne and a filter pot. So um, would recommend not using those. Interestingly enough, Silverdyne was on the innovative Ebola technology list until we got it off. So we can talk more about silver. Um, my colleague Jennifer, who manages our work on the drinking water guidelines, um, did a systematic review of silver, and it concludes with this that silver doesn't really do much besides maybe a log removal of, of bacteria. Okay, round two, we doubled the number of products, so that was really exciting because we want to basically get to a point where we have 50, 60 products on our list, so any procurer can go to this list and, and be assured that whatever they're choosing um, will have some health benefit. So you can see all the products listed here. The, the one thing I wanted to mention is we're increasingly seeing more innovation. So um, unlike, I also have started to dabble in healthcare waste, um, where we don't see much innovation here, I think that this particular kind of set of technologies lends itself for people to try new approaches, especially combined approaches. So you see we had a flocculation disinfection with filtration. Um, we are seeing a lot more um, UV for the first time, lo low cost UV. The ones on the bottom are the ones that I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, in, in part because our original testing um, was inconclusive um, and that stems from the fact that our test water was having too much chlorine demand and as a result all the products were failing. And so when we went back to look at, okay, what is it about our test water that has too much chlorine demand, we found that our, the, the ingredient that we were using for total organic carbon, humic acid, 
um, was exerting much more chlorine demand as were our viruses than what we would find in natural water. So then we worked with Danielle and looked at other literature to see, okay, what are we finding in, in our natural water? And basically we came to the, the conclusion of this brief review that in um, uh, non turbid sources, so bore wells, it's about 1.5 generally as a chlorine demand versus surface waters, it's more around three. But what was really interesting is we saw a lot of variation. So even in bore wells, you could have non-turbid water that had a high chlorine demand. And conversely, even in your surface water sources, you may have water that didn't have very much um, total organic carbon um, and therefore the chlorine demand was lower. So the bottom line is that Chlorination um, really requires a very site-specific approach. So this kind of okay, drop a tablet in and pray that you'll reach the type, the the right residual. I guess in in a lot of cases it may work, but what we found is that chlorine demand is very variable. It depends on lots of variables even beyond the um, organic matter you have, it salts, temperature, pH, um, and that really means that you need to have a very specific approach. And I, I guess the, the second point I wanted to mention is that traditionally it's never been a primary source of treatment, right? It's usually a finishing treatment at a treatment plant after they've done filtration, coagulation. So I think it's also kind of lending the point that ideally it should be done in conjunction with a well-managed system and not just done um, alone as a solo treatment. So this is from a round two and I can't give you all the product names right now because we're still um, uh, conveying these results to our manufacturers. We'll be re re uh, producing our result in April. There is a summary in the back of um, the non-chlorine products uh, that you're happy to take now. As you can see, we had three products that provided little or no protection. And I'm going to show in the next slide an example of one of these products, actually a membrane filter. So for the first time, we found that membranes weren't doing so well. And um, it's because we have huge variations between um, filters taken from different lots, which basically lends itself, there's a quality control issue. So it's either the filter itself or it's how the membrane is attached to the rest of the casing. We had lots of products um, in this targeted protection. So this is something that we wouldn't recommend long term. Targeted is more, okay, you, you know that you have a particular pathogen of concern, whether it's cholera, whether it's a virus, um, and you want to have a, an intervention that you can immediately deploy. But for longer term, and even probably medium term, we would be recommending products that are either two or three stars, so that provide some assurance for all three classes of pathogens. I just put this up here, that performance in the field can be up to two to three logs lower, and this is coming from um, the, and I'm going to get the name wrong, but there was a study done on filters and emergencies, and my colleague Batsi um, was um, just at that meeting that happened on Monday, and they were looking at how do these filters actually perform in the field. So we know that in lab, that's by far the best case scenario, right? When you get them into the household and they get bonged around, I've seen some, you're nodding, yes, kids are playing with it, it will be even lower. So that would suggest even those targeted uh, protection projects may not be achieving much health effects in the field. Um, so this basically summarizes what I, what I already said about the chlorine demand. And I think when moving away from um, a set dosing to, towards having a set residual, and that will require um, thinking much more carefully about your dosing, which likely will be quite variable. And I was very, um, happy to talk to Tom and he was telling me about how CDC is trying to even move towards systems where you have like a chlorine doser that can be automatically making those adjustments to your supplies. But at the minimum, having someone who's trained not only in doing the chlorine testing but understanding how to adjust your dosing um, is quite important. Um, and as I said already, obviously that lends itself to more centralized approaches. Um, I think th just the key takeaway is that there are lots of products out there that work. So it's not all bad news. There's, there's lots of things that work and there's lots of different options depending on cultural constraints, user constraints, logistic constraints. So that I think is quite exciting. We do have five out of 30 products that fail and these obviously are uh, manufacturers that were quite confident about their product when they submitted to us, right? Because you wouldn't submit something you didn't think was going to pass. So that 
is slightly worrisome and we will be um yeah we need to talk to our legal team as well because there's lots of legal implications about how we advertise the things that don't work but obviously we want to get those off the market um some of which are some of them are distributed actually quite widely at the moment um i think the biggest thing is that as i mentioned the manufacturing quality control is quite weak performance claims are overstated, and the use instructions continues to be a huge issue, even for us when we do the testing, because the manufacturers um, have contradicting use instructions. They tell us they want it to test in a certain way, like, you know, leave the chlorine sachet in there for five hours, even though the use instruction says 30 minutes. So they're, they're um, trying to get the best bang out of their product, but may not be how people actually use it in the field. This is the example from the filter, and as I said, that um, if you look at this graph, our minimum log removal for bacteria is two log, which is the green line. You can see that the mean for all three filters was quite high, um, but you look at these unit two, unit three, and they did quite poorly. So um, we really is, you know, like my colleague from IATME was talking about the importance of looking the, at the heterogeneity. It's the same for these products. You can't just look at the average, but you really need to look at each product. Um, and another thing I just wanted to mention, and hopefully could be of use to countries and, and other procurers, is coming up with a very simple checklist of what you should be looking for when a manufacturer comes to present your product. So sometimes it may be a product we haven't tested, but there's lots of different things that you know are important to look about where it's been tested, what things it's been tested against, um, the use instructions, obviously. These are all um, claims made by products that fail. So um, we can see that you can kind of say a lot, but it, it's important to look at the evidence that's there. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that it has to go through the international schema, although we would encourage it. Um, in summary, just to say, maybe it's stating the obvious, but there's no benefit in distributing products that don't work, right? Like it's just a waste of time and money, but it also gives a very false sense of security to the user itself, right? So there's ethical, ethical issues as well. Um, to do chlorination well, there needs to be a lot of monitoring and technical oversight. Um, send us your products or names of products for round three. We have a nice subsidy, so it doesn't cost very much. And potentially the, the manufacturer gains a lot because we're moving to a system now, instead of waiting till we have a huge batch and producing a big report, that we're going to be doing rolling testing and submissions, and we'll be doing these product sheets, these two-page sheets. So as soon as we tested the product, we'll produce the results, and the manufacturer then has that sheet that they can use to show others about how their product performs. Um, and lastly, our full report is coming out in April, so be on the lookout, and thank you. <laughs>